super. Okay, so we're starting the gospel, not starting, but continuing on in the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna tonight. And we are on the last page of chapter 14. Um, we read that poem, or that which he was singing about, uh, which is uh, really just telling us to cling to the Divine Mother and uh, and to discern. Oops. Here comes Beth, just a moment. He's really teaching us to discern, and we were talking about that quite a bit last weekend. And he's just going to say a couple more things, which could be helpful. I thought about skipping over them, but then something kept scratching the back of my head, so I thought, well, maybe not. Maybe we'll get in there and see what he has to say. So Takur is just in straight up teaching mode here. He says, one must not be proud of one's money. If you say that you are rich, then one can remind you that there are still richer men than you and others richer still and so on. So it's just funny because in the 90s when I was in, in uh, working as, a, as an analyst, a uh, computer analyst at San Francisco State University, uh, you know, a bill... Bill Gates and uh, who is the owner of Oracle Corporation? Anyway, those two corporations kept flipping back and forth about, and you know, oh, Larry Ellison. And one day, Larry Ellison would be the richest man in the world. And then the next day or two, you know, his stock would tumble a little bit. And then Bill Gates was the number one richest person in the world. And I always thought to myself, I was like, boy, if that just isn't a lesson right there, <laughs> you know, you can't even securely be the richest man in the world. It just kind of bobs back and forth. And uh, so it just goes to show you there's never enough. Uh, it's, it's never, it, you, can't, you can't build security in the world of change. Everything is always shifting and we're not in charge of how it shifts. We're not in control of how it changes. And so this discernment, don't, don't make yourself or don't become proud, uh, in this case, of your money. But, but as you go through it, uh, you know, one time I, uh, I used to sing quite a bit at the temple in Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, a few people told me that, uh, that they liked my singing. They thought I had a nice voice. And uh, somewhere around that time, I realized that I, I had a little tinge of pride about that or was or is developing some because you know uh several people in a row had told me and i i you know i i felt it in my body and i was like well wait a minute here mind what is this what did you have to do with your voice <laughs> you know it's like being proud of being beautiful what did you have to do with that <laughs> you know <laughs> you were you were born that way you got some some genes and then it made you this way got this voice you got this face you got this body this hair color you know whatever it is and yet the mind you know the mind with egoism will gather up anything and give itself credit for it you know and so this discernment when we become when we become proud in any particular area the problem with that is that pride puts up boundaries you know pride makes you too good for some people or too good to be with other people, or uh, makes you expect certain treatments uh, and certain honors and certain forms of respect. And all of those things are wedges, you know, they're, they're things that will separate you and, and uh, cause division. They don't bring you toward the unity. So they're vice, they, they're, they're unhelpful. And so Ramakrishna is saying here, don't be proud of your money. You're, not, you're never going to be the richest man in the world. There's always going to be somebody richer than you and somebody richer than them. And if it's not today, give it a few days. Uh, you know, wait until the next whatever revolution comes along and you've got 16-year-olds this time becoming, <laughs> becoming billionaires and running companies. So he said, uh, you know, if you say that you are rich, one can remind you that there are richer men than you and other richer still, and so on. At dusk, the glow worm comes out and thinks that it lights the world. But its pride is crushed when the stars appear in the sky. The stars feel that they give light to the earth, 
But when the moon rises, the stars fade in shame. The moon feels that the world smiles at its light and that it lights the earth. Then the eastern horizon becomes red and the sun rises and the moon fades and after a while is no longer seen. If wealthy people would think that way, they would get rid of their pride and their wealth. Manilal had provided a sumptuous feast in celebration of the festival. He entertained the master and the other guests with great love and attention. It was late at night when they returned to their homes. So that's the close of chapter 14. But this discernment, you know, Takor, every spiritual path actually talks about this inner discernment. Uh, you know, not letting yourself get trapped up in things and seeing things in a particular way that isn't true. And one of the big elements of that is, one, the impermanence of things, you know, that Takor talks about. Everything in this world has uh, the, the expiration date on it. So don't attach to those things. The only thing that, that uh, you know, you should seek out is that inner stillness, uh, that inner self, the, the witness. That is the only secure, unchanging thing in the world. And when all of that withdrawal from the things of change has happened, uh, what you are becomes apparent to you. And so that's why it's so important for that. Everything else, all these other forms of identity, these forms of pride, these gathering of, of attributes that encourage our sense of self through the ego, uh, that's, that's our delusion. That's what's breaking us down. So let go of those things. The second thing is that it's a relative world. So nothing is big until it's measured with something that's small. You know? no, no, no thing in a relative world can have an attribute without having a comparison to something else. Something can't be yellow unless something is a different color. If there was only one color, there would be no color. We wouldn't name them. And so knowing that all things are relative, as he's doing here with the glowworm, who may be proud of his uh, great light until the stars come out, until the moon comes out, until the sun comes out, it's all relative. It was a wonderful YouTube video that shows the relative size. It starts with the Earth, right? And then it compares us to like Saturn, and then it compares us to Jupiter, and then it compares us to the sun, and then it compares our sun to like another sun, and then another sun. And pretty soon you're you're talking scales that we cannot even begin to fathom. I mean, Betelgeuse, the world's or the universe's largest sun so far, I think. Of course, they probably found another one by now. But, you know, the Earth is like a, like a, a pinpoint next to our sun. And then our sun is like a pinpoint next to Betelgeuse. You know, it's like you just can't even imagine how big these things are. So keep your mind open and, and perusing the reality and learn from it. And don't grab onto things that feed an ego perspective. Uh, break them down by, by observing and by seeing so that you don't create division in your life. You don't separate yourself from others, but that you allow love to become your primary attribute. And it's the cord of love that ties us all into a unity. That, that will that will make us human <laughs> in that sense. All right, moving on to chapter 15 here. It's Wednesday, November 28th, 1883, and it's two o'clock in the afternoon in Dakshineshwar. Is it? Oh, nope, we're at Keshav Chandra Sen's house, sorry. It's two o'clock in the afternoon M was pacing the footpath of the circular road in front of the lily cottage where Keshav Chandra Sen lived. He was eagerly awaiting the arrival of Sri Ramakrishna. Yeah, Keshav and, and Ramakrishna were great friends. Uh, Keshav was a great spiritual man who was starting, or at least working at the forefront of that movement uh, of the uh, Brahmo Samaj. So he's waiting for his friend Ramakrishna to show up. Keshav is quite ill, though, at this point. It says Keshav's illness had taken a serious turn, and there was very little chance of his recovery. Since the master loved Keshav dearly, he was coming from Dakshineshwar to pay him a visit. My goodness, here we are for the second night in a row, looking at people on their deathbed. <laughs> so, uh, 
you know so again we tie into last night this whole network of love that the divine mother had around her all of all these people that she was loving and nurturing and taking care of and empathizing with and moving forward and we talked a little bit about how though even though her body has passed you know that her body dropped off more than 100 years ago and yet even our community is built around the love of mother you know as uh, she's continuing to build community to bring people together in a spirit of love and uh, it was just a wonderful ideal to hold on to to see that as ourself and here now we see the master also has this network of love if you read the great master if you read uh, uh, the works of swamiji all the direct disciples at some point talk about how how beyond telling us there's no way you could possibly understand the level to which we felt the love of the master, you know, that, 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 that was the primary attribute of him as teacher was the amount of love that he showered on the devotees. And that's why things last a hundred years or 200 years or a thousand years, you know, Buddha and his compassion, the world is still being, inspired and he's still building communities of compassion communities of purity communities of of service you know uh, and jesus of course the same thing there you know the love that he had echoed over thousands of years and so this is the potential of the love that is that is our nature that is innate in us that is ours as heirs we are children of the divine we're not beggars for our freedom from God, we're not beggars of heaven. Uh, we that that we are heirs uh, to this, and you know it's through grace that we accept it, not through accomplishment. And so, uh, so at this point, Keshav's illness has taken a serious turn, and there's little, very little chance of his recovery. The master loved him dearly and was going to come from Dakshineshwar to pay him a visit. On the east side of the circular road was Victoria College, where the ladies of Keshab's Brahmo Samaj and their daughters received their education. To the north of the college was a spacious garden house inhabited by an English family. M noticed that there was a commotion in the house and wondered what was going on. Presently, a hearse arrived with the drivers dressed in black, and the members of the household appeared looking very sad. There had been a death in the family. Whither does the soul go, leaving behind this mortal body? Pondering that age-old question, M waited, watching the carriage that came from the north. Make sure nobody's waiting. Okay. About five o'clock, a carriage stopped in front of the lily cottage, and Sri Ramakrishna got out with Latu and several other devotees, including Rakal. He was received by Keshab's relatives, who led him and the devotees upstairs to the veranda south of the drawing room. The master seated himself on a couch. After a long wait, he became impatient to see Keshab. Keshab's disciples said that he was resting and that he would be there presently. Sri Ramakrishna became more and more impatient and said to Keshab's disciple, Look here, what need is there of his coming to me? Why can't I just go in and see him? Prasanna humbly, sir, he will come in a few minutes. Master, go away. It is you who are making all this fuss. Let me go in. Prasanna began to talk about Keshav in order to divert the master's attention. He said, Keshav is now an altogether different person. Like you, sir, he talks to the divine mother. He hears what the mother says, and he laughs and cries. When he was told that Keshav talked to the Divine Mother and laughed and cried, the Master became ecstatic. Presently, he went into Samadhi. You know, that's the love. <laughs> He's so excited uh, so that somebody has realized or is, has, uh, you know, fa is falling in love with the Divine Mother. It's to the point that he, he's in, his internal celebration goes all the way into ecstasy. You know, he gets so excited about that. <laughs> You know, these are things that are helpful when, you, when you're thinking about Takor in your mind and wondering, you know, how, what would it be like to be around him? These are the kinds of things you have to remember about his characteristics. 
that, that he would be proud enough of your efforts in your spiritual life to be tossed into ecstasy over them. Uh, you know, that he would look at you and see the divine in you. And those eyes of his would look right through your eyes and right through all of your list of attributes that you play your part with in this world. And he would see you, the Atman, and you would feel that look. You know, you would feel that penetration and it would help you come to realize where you are way back in there, that you're not this body, this list of uh, attributes and restrictions and limitations that you've assumed yourself to be that you're not all of the attributes that you dance with to show your personality and share your ideas and your actions with the world, but that you're something far more permanent, far more powerful than that, that you are that very nature of love, the love that, that has made these greats that have come from the divine remembered through the ages. And so if you're somebody who has that ambition to be remembered when you die, it's not by building a big bridge or building a tall building or building a big company that it's going to happen. Become a great lover of people. That is the way to be remembered if, that, if that's your goal in life, to, to be remembered when you die. You know, and, and uh, of course, to be a lover of people, you let go of those ambitions ultimately because it has nothing to do with anything. But, you know, give, give your desires a spiritual turn if you can't beat them. That's what Takor says, you know, if you can't stop lusting, then lust for God. You know, give everything a spiritual turn to the divine like that. It was winter and the master was wearing a green flannel coat and a shawl thrown over it. I've seen that. I've held that coat, actually. <laughs> It's very small. The Takor must have been a very small, small-sized person. He, he, he sat straight with his eyes fixed, deep in ecstasy. A long time passed in this way. There was no indication of his returning to the normal plane of consciousness. Gradually, it became dark. Lamps were lighted in the drawing room where the master was now to go. While he was slowly coming down to the plane of ordinary consciousness, he was taken there, through, though with great difficulty. The room was well furnished. At the sight of the furniture, the master muttered to himself, these things were necessary before, but what use are they now? You know, that's that interesting thing. Uh, our wealth is nice when we're young, nice when we're middle-aged, and even nice through the beginnings of old age. But, you know, at some point for many people, uh, I know my friend Bill was taking care of a woman. I won't give her name because she's quite well known. But, you know, she owned several houses around the world and several big palaces. And uh, she had a huge one in San Francisco. But in the final couple of years of her life, she couldn't get out of bed. So, you know, that's what the master is referring to. It's like, well, it's a nice, this house was necessary at one point. But boy, it's not necessary now. <laughs> you know, she can't enjoy it. And so this is what discernment will save you from. Don't spend your whole life gathering things that will be useless to you at one point, at some day, some day in your in, in life. You know, build things that are lasting. And what is lasting? Your nature, love is lasting, wisdom is last is lasting. That that is how we build something lasting and meaningful. It's not done with materials. Materials will always return to their source. They will always decay and go back to their simplest form. But love alone remains. That's why Vivekananda says, only one thing will follow you beyond the grave, and that is your virtue. That's your virtue. That's the only thing that follows us beyond the grave. So at the sight of the furniture, the master muttered to himself, well, these things were necessary before, but what use are they now? Seeing recall, he said, oh, hello, are you here? Then seating himself on a couch, he again lost consciousness of the outer world and looking around as if seeing someone, he said, hello, mother, I see that you have come. How you are showing off in your Benares sari. 
don't bother me now, please sit down and be quiet. <laughs> now, how's that for, <laughs> how's that for a relationship with God when you can tell her to sit down and be quiet? <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> the master was in a state of intense divine intoxication. In the well-lighted room, the Brahmo devotees sat around the master. Latu and Rakal and M remained near him. He was saying to himself, still filled with divine fervor, the body and the soul, the body was born and it will die. But for the soul, there is no death. It is like the betel nut. When the nut is ripe, it does not stick to the shell. But when it is green, it is difficult to separate it from the shell. After realizing God, one does not identify oneself anymore with the body. Then one knows that the body and the soul are two different things. It's a wonderful way of putting it. That was the coconut ripens, you know, the meat pulls away from the shell on the inside and you can get that rattle sound in there. And for us, it's the same when we ripen. When we, when we, ripening means that, that uh, we have begin removing that idea of me and mine and that attachment uh, to things that change. And as we begin removing that attachment and discerning and knowing the truth about our internal nature and who we are and what we are, uh, then we, we, quite, we see quite clearly that we're not the body. We, we experientially see quite clearly that we're not the mind. Uh, but in the beginning, you know, it's very hard for us to imagine that we're not a body and that we're not a mind because we haven't done any of the discerning. We haven't gone in and sorted out what's what inside. You know, and so our practice is a lot more than just going in and, and muttering a mantra. Our practice has a lot to do with going inside and observing the nature of our inner experience. You know, and I've talked a lot about these things lately because these are the things that I'm learning at the moment that in my own practice is, is how clear it becomes that you're not a body when you start paying attention to your internal world and how clear it becomes that you're not a mind as you begin to discern inside and get comfortable with your internal furniture as it, as it were. And then you come to know that all desires arise from either the body or the mind and never from you, the witness, because the witness is that always content, always still, absolute, unchanging presence of love, wisdom, and being. So that is, that is your nature. And uh, that's what Tatva Mayananda says, you know, he says, our practice is to get us to the point where that which is obvious will finally become apparent to us. <laughs> And so it's not a philosophical uh, a conjecture that you're not the body and that you're not the mind. That's not like a Vedantic philosophy that's interesting to think about. None of these things are. That's one of the beauties of, of spiritual life is that you're not dealing with the make-believe. You know, of course, some, some, some have taken that approach <laughs> and some get caught up in that kind of thing. But it's really about going in and finding out what's what getting a very good sense of how you are arranged as a, a, a being and going inside and, and, and seeing. And, uh, you know, that, that mantra is actually your own name, ultimately, in the highest realization. And so that's why it reverberates within. And that's why it kind of slowly combs out the tangles as you continue to repeat it. And then through... The years, the more sincerely you've repeated it, the more you've, you've exercised the awareness of the presence that it, that it provokes. Uh, what you're actually discovering is your own nature, you know, that you are that image of God, that image of the divine in there. And so the master's thinking that all the time. He's now in this high state. He's actually having a vision of the mother asking her to come in and sit down, telling her that she's showing off, being dressed so nicely in her binar, sorry. And this is the, you know, I like this kind of revelation from Ramakrishna because it gives us a wonderful hint about this relationship with the divine. You know, if you're on the path of devotion, uh, you know, which he heavily encouraged everybody, saying it's the fastest way, given the circumstances of the modern world, it's the fastest path for realizing God. 
and uh, but knowing the divine you, you know you i'm afraid that so often when we when we when we do our practices and stuff you know we're taught to be so terribly careful uh, about god you know if I don't offer this and offer this only that way and don't touch it with this hand and you know it's like there's so many rules and so many regulations that we've put around it and here Takor just told the divine mother to sit down and be quiet <laughs> you know tells her she's showing off oh you're showing off in your benares silk today this is the kind of relationship that you are allowed to have with the beloved it can be casual it can be free you can have a nickname for her him that you know it's up to you that relationship will build inside in, according to your disposition god will always appear to you as your highest as your highest ideal of love so you know he may look an awful lot like your grandmother <laughs> or he may look an awful lot like jesus <laughs> or like buddha really depending on your highest estimation of love what is it in you and your deep within your psyche that represents the highest ideal of love and that is that is the form that mother will take in order to touch you in order to love you in order to make you aware of that love right as you grow and so don't be nervous around the beloved don't take license i mean don't be respect disrespectful but you can be honest, you know, you can yell, you can be angry, you can blame, <laughs> you know, if you're really in the mood, you can call mother name, God called the divine names, uh, all these fun things. And I, I tell you, you know, I, I, I can already hear people out there, you know, in, in the world poo-pooing, oh, look, they're preparing their, their imaginary friend. And yes, that will be true for a while. It is true in the first days, months, years, depending on the, the intensity of your practice, it will be imagination. You will be imagining God's form, imagining mother, mother's presence inside. But that doesn't last long. If you stick to your practice and are regular in it and you are sincere and earnest in it, it won't be long till you begin to realize that you've, you've, you are becoming aware of something that does have an existence and that it will grow in its power until the point that it will do what it does to Sri Ramakrishna. It will take, takes him over, takes him to, to higher uh, regions of awareness of consciousness and uh, allows him uh, to experience things that are beyond the senses. And so it, it, that which begins as imagination becomes real. And if that doesn't seem likely to you, then look around. Every single thing that you see right now in most of our environments started in someone's imagination, the chair I'm sitting in. Someone drew that on a piece of paper for the first time, and now it sits in my room. Where am I sitting now in this building? This building used to be in the woods. And then somebody drew a picture and imagined a house and outlined it, and then went and put the effort to manifest it. And this is what we do in our spiritual life. Yes, in the beginning, it's imagination, but it, it manifests. You know, this, this is how creation happens. This is how manifestation happens. This is how, uh, you know, the Lord plays, the divine plays. At this moment, Keshav entered the room. He came through the east door. Those who remembered the man who had preached in the town hall or the Brahmo Samaj temple were shocked to see his skeleton covered with skin. He could hardly stand. He walked holding to the wall for support. With great difficulty, he sat down in front of the couch. In the meantime, Sri Ramakrishna had gotten down from the couch and was sitting on the floor. Kesha bowed low before the master and remained in that position a long time, touching the master's feet with, with his forehead. Then he sat up and Sri Ramakrishna was still in a state of ecstasy. He muttered to himself. He talked to the Divine Mother. Raising his voice, Kesha said, I am here, sir. I'm here. He took Sri Ramakrishna's left hand and stroked it gently. 
kind of reminds me of the Dalai Lama and uh, Desmond Tutu in that uh, the other night we watched a documentary where they have a conversation on joy uh, how, and how to, how to have joy in a troubled world. And one of the things that was just so beautiful is the Dalai Lama continually kept reaching over and taking Desmond Tutu's hand and just holding it like a friend. And when they greeted each other, you know, Desmond Tutu took the took his took uh, the Dalai Lama's chin in his hand and was looking at him from side to side to kind of see how much he had changed, you know. And and then the Dalai Lama pursed his lips and went. <laughs> It's just, you know, two, just, it was like two young eight-year-old boys uh, meeting as, after a long time apart and just having such a sweet friendship in there. And so here, this is happening now between Keshav and Sri Ramakrishna, you know, because these, these, these people who have dedicated themselves to their spiritual life and done this level of practice, there's, an, there's a childlike innocence about them, a child look, a childlike vulnerability to the world. They don't have a proud, a pride. They don't have an expectation that, that they 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 are very free, you know, and absolutely authentic. There, there's just no pretense there. They don't have a persona that they've developed to run their dinner parties. <laughs> He took Sri Ramakrishna's left hand and stroked it gently, but the master was in deep samadhi, completely intoxicated with divine love. A stream of words came from his lips as he talked to himself, and the devotees listened to him spellbound. Boy, I tell you, I would be right there, because <laughs> he's he's in he's in ecstasy. You know, he's seeing the divine mother. He's having a conversation with her. He's completely oblivious to. The other bodies in the room, he's not seeing that. He's, he's at a level of consciousness where he's actually seeing God, seeing the presence, and having this just conversation, just a flow of words going on. Uh, I remember one time waking up in the middle of the night. Actually, it happened three times. I, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I heard Swami talking in his room. And uh, the first two times, I, I just was like, uh, what, I don't know what that is, but I just rolled over and went back to sleep. The third time it happened, you know, I went, I got, I was just too curious. I got up and I went out and went across the hall to Swami's door and I kind of pushed it open a little bit and I looked inside and, and uh, Swami was sitting up in his bed. He wasn't, didn't seem to be uh, present, you know, it wasn't aware of me uh, looking in the door and he was talking to the divine mother, you know, just, just, a simple little conversation. I couldn't obviously hear the other side of the conversation, but he was having half of that thought, and I, and I quietly closed his door, kind of in awe, and went back to my room and just sat there and thought about that for a while. And the, in the morning at breakfast, I asked him, I said, did you see me come in your room last night? He says, no, no, why did you come in my room? And I said, well, Maharaj, I woke up, I heard you talking. And as I came closer to your door, I could hear that you were talking to the Divine Mother. And I, I couldn't uh, resist looking in to see what was going on. And he said, oh, is it so? And I said, yes, Maharaj. And then he just laughed. He laughed it off and he said, oh, if she would only come visit me when I'm awake. <laughs> you know? And so this, 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 <laughs> this Divine conversation going on boy just like the rest of these guys i would be right there just like eavesdropping with all of my power you know, <laughs> turning my bionic ear on Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> the master as long as a man associates himself with upadis so long he sees the manifold you know upadis being attributes with yourself those limitations and restrictions that you've gathered together it's a funny way of thinking about it. And it was when I first read Rama or Vivekananda where he described, he said that personality that you love so much is just a collection of, of limitations and restrictions. I didn't understand what he was saying for a while, but as I sat and thought about it over the years, maybe, I don't know how long it took me to figure it out, but uh, those, that just means that, you know, you, you take on attributes. You know, if you're if you identify as a white man, well, you don't identify as a black man, so that's a limitation. 
If you identify yourself as 59, then you're not 60, so that's a restriction. Uh, if you identify yourself as a male, then you're not female, so that's a, a restriction, a limitation. And so this, every limitation that we put on ourselves, every restriction that we put on ourselves, he says here that because of that, uh, you know, we see the manifold world. That's, that's why we don't see this one without a second. That's why we don't see the divine when we, when we observe the world, because we, we're looking through a mirror or a lens of restrictions and limitations. So it causes us, you know, it causes us to perceive the world in a particular way, right? That's why, that's why traditionally women sit on one side of the room and men sit on the other side of the room, uh, because that's quite a pesky identification that we've come up with, you know? And so we, we try and reduce those effects. We try and emphasize the commonality, the common factor, which is the true self, that we're neither men nor women. I've often thought I, I find it fascinating that the world has, been, or that at least our culture has been so has become so aware of gender and gradients of gender in there. And it's funny because you know I, I know that a lot of spiritual people are, are very judgmental about that, but the fact of the matter is that that's actually a quite a, quite a, a sign of some spiritual insight to not know what your gender is or to not see your gender easily match the gender of a body because you're not the body and you're not that gender. And that gender is in fact a construct you know, of mind. And so it's actually a, a very nice uh, a spiritual insight to, to not be firmly uh, convinced of a gender associated with the body. The problem is, is that you know, we take that insight and then we go look for another identity, <laughs> another tag, a different name or a multiple name we really should just accept that freedom and just not worry about people's gender and <laughs> just you know, let people be people uh, as they are. And, uh, and for those who are having that experience of not having a gender like their body, don't worry about it. It's not an abnormality. That's, that's actually super normal because you're not the body and you never were the body and you've had many bodies, you know, you may have been a woman, you may have been a man, you may have been something in between, you may have been both. Uh, you know, all of these happen within God's play. And uh, how it's manifesting is not the point. What is manifesting is the point. And so don't get all worked up in what you're manifesting. You know, am I a man? Am I a woman? Am I somewhere in between? Am I going to transition or not transition? You know, but play the game as you like to play. Those are not the important things. The important thing is what is it in you that is manifesting? And what is its nature? And what can you find out about it so that you can pay attention to the things that are going to give you a fulfilling life? Because life becomes familiar, fulfilling to us when we live in accordance with our nature. And if we don't know what our nature is, our quest for happiness will be erratic and unfruitful. But when you come to understand that the nature of that divine spirit within you is love, then you know that all acts of love, all recognition of love, will fulfill you because it's in alignment with what you are. When you come to know that that inner spirit's major uh, expression is wisdom, then you develop your inner wisdom. You develop your inner eyes. You see the world objectively. And that will build fulfillment. You know? And then you know that the, the third aspect of that is your being, your isness, your existence. And so you learn to be in the moment. And being in the moment sets you free from the resentments of the past and from the anxieties of the future and puts your karma square in your hand. You become the controller of your destiny. You are the one that determines the nature of, of, of your experience of the present. And so by learning your inner nature, then you, become, then you become aware of how to live because you finally know what you are. And by knowing that, you find your fulfillment, right? So 
so a stream of words coming from his lips as he talked to himself. As long as a man associates himself with Upanis, with, with attributes, so long he sees the manifold, the many, such as Kesha, Prasana, Amrita, and so on. But on attaining perfect knowledge, he sees only one consciousness everywhere. Perfect knowledge means knowledge of self, knowledge of the, of the divine within you, knowledge of what, what God is, at least within language. God. Really, to look at God, we have to just sit there in silence because there are no words. That's why ecstasy, you know, that's why samadhi. On attaining perfect knowledge, he sees only one consciousness everywhere. We look in every, every eye that we look into, we see God. We see the divine presence in all living things and even in non-living things. The same perfect knowledge, again, makes him realize that the one consciousness has become the universe and its living beings and the 24 cosmic principles. But the manifestations of divine power are different in different beings. It is he undoubtedly who has become everything, but in some cases there is a greater manifestation than in others. Right? So that's the only difference between us, is it's difference in power. You know, Ramakrishna helps us to understand that it's, it's like, you know, yes, a clay elephant, you know, this big giant clay elephant and a clay mouse. Yes, absolutely, they're both made of clay, but one is this giant elephant and the other one is this small mouse. So even though they, they are of the same thing, their manifestation is different according to the power within them. So yes, you are a Jesus if you had that level of spiritual power running through you, if you had that clarity uh, uh, and purity of mind within you, it would shine through like that. But, uh, you know, for, for us as normal people, uh, <laughs> we don't think about becoming a Jesus. You know, we, we think about being the best we can be. We think about uh, finding out as much as we can and allowing that to manifest, right? And so that is our lot in life. But we are made of the same material as Jesus. We have the same image of God within us as Jesus. It's just that for Jesus, there was no egoism. There was no me and mine, no, no fascination with a separate self. He saw his, his union with everyone and everything. And that was the reason for his love. Same with Buddha. The reason for his empathy and his compassion is he knew himself to be everyone. You know, Sri Nishrigadatta makes that same statement. You know, that we see our oneness with everything and that's how we learn to serve. We don't look for things that need help and then go help. No, we see ourselves in every person and we alleviate suffering as we encounter it. That's our nature. But the divine manifestations of divine power are different in different beings. It is he undoubtedly who has become everything. But in some cases, there is a greater manifestation than in others. Vidyasagar once asked me, can it be true that God has endowed some with greater power and some with less? I replied, well, if it weren't so, how is it that one man may be stronger than 50? If that were not the case, again, how is it that we have all come here to see you? <laughs> right? If God doesn't give different levels of power to different human beings... You know, why would we go see a particular person? Why would we go listen to a particular singer? It's like, yes, the, the difference in power is, is, is obvious. So, yes, your expectations are placed on you by the amount of power that the mother has given you. you know? And not that we have to suss that out. We don't. We just have to do whatever we can with whatever we have and go forward in our practice. The Lord never compares us to others. It's to each other. It's to ourself. It's our own ideal that we compare ourselves to. The soul through which God sports, right? So God is sporting through your soul. 
Now, this is an important deal because this is what this is what really opens the potential for for a delightful uh, intimacy between you and the beloved. Uh, your God is sporting through your soul, right? And what's he sporting with? The ego, right? The ego's the ball. He's kicking around, as it were. And so he's actually the one, she's actually the one living your life, right? Uh, so there's an intimacy of awareness. You are in the mother's dream. So she knows the contents of the dream better than you do. She knows the nature of the dream. She knows the dreamer, right? We just play our role in the dream, but there is no real us there. We are all made of the mind stuff of God. And so there is one without a second, although it appears as many, because for some mysterious reason, we've identified with particular. You know, take your own dream at night. And I know I talk about this stuff all the time. I'm just waiting for myself to get it. So pardon me. But this, this, this whole thinking about your dream at night, everything you encounter in that dream is you. It's all made of the mind of the sleeper. But for some reason, when you entered into the dream, you didn't enter in as everyone. You picked a particular. You decided, hey, I'm that body there. That's what I'm going to be. And now I'm that. And everything else in the dream is separate from me. Right? We've even talked, I've even shared that, that lucid dream where I realized that other, other, as, other characters in your dream can also develop ego. They also can see themselves as separate from you, the main character, who is identified, well, not identified, but sourced in uh, the sleeper, you know, the dreamer. So it's a fascinating thing to think about, that, that it's quite plausible uh, that we are within a universal mind, that we are the dream of some greater being, you know. And that that greater being, for whatever reason, has identified himself as each one of us. And so we live in a world of multiplicity, unaware that it's a dream, unaware that it is all made of the divine mind stuff, the cosmic dust, as it were. And that in reality, each one of us in our very center is identified directly with the dreamer and not the dreamed. And that's the point of life, is to come to the knowledge that you are dreaming while you're still asleep, that is awakening, that is enlightenment, to know the nature of the dream while you're in it, that it is all you, that it is all one. And well, that's can you give an example of uh, when you said other characters also develop ego? Can you give an uh -huh. example of that? Or oh, sure. You know? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. I, I love to tell that story. I just was afraid to drag you through it again. <laughs> I had that dream where I was floating in the yellow inner tube, remember, in, in, uh, in Monterey Bay in my dream. And I became aware that I was dreaming. I, I had a lucid dream. And because at the time I was a software engineer, I was particularly fascinated with the resolution of everything in the dream, how absolutely real it was. I was splashing my hand in, over the edge of the inner tube in the water and watching the, the little driblets of water get caught in the hairs on my fingers, on my knuckles. And I was seeing that in the dream. And I was like, no way. That's incredible. Uh, there was because I was aware and I was looking and I could see it's perfect. There is nothing unreal about it at all. And I looked at the ice plant that was growing off of the cliffs. I saw the same thing. It was like I could see the dirt and the pebbles between the leaves of the ice plant on the cliff on the uh, next to the bay. And I was again, I was like, what? That's unbelievable that my mind in real time, as I'm looking at it in my dream, is creating this level of reality, this level of detail. I was amazed. And over to my left was another yellow inner tube. And sitting in that inner tube was a young woman, a young girl, I think probably around eight years old or something. And she had her hair, little blonde, very white blonde hair, little ringlets, a kind of semi-wet hair. And so I got curious about her, not as a girl, but as an element of my dream that was, that was manifesting in perfect resolution. Because as I got near to her, I could see the little peach fuzz hairs on her cheek that the water had matted down as had dripped off of her head. And so I was paddling over closer to get a, 
just to look, just to appreciate that, just to look at it. And as I got right next to her, to her inner tube, she threw an attitude at me. She's like, get away from me. Who are you? As if she existed. <laughs> as if, as if she saw me as separate from her, but she's using my mind to exist. She's using my dream to be. And I woke up, I, I, in my dream, I began laughing and I actually woke up laughing. And I sat there the rest of the night just amazed because I was thinking to myself, wow, in my own dream is a character that thinks they exist separate and apart from me. What an odd thing that is. So that's what I mean, that the characters in our dream are self-actuated. You know, those, those boys that are chasing you through the inner city, you know, <laughs> each one of them believes they exist. And uh, I couldn't go back to sleep that night because, you know, I was just starting to read the Vedanta back then. And just and I'd learned just enough to make that association and think, oh, my God, it's it's totally possible. I have a working example of how you could be made of the same thing, that you all could be one and still have an actuating understand an actuated understanding of yourself as separate and apart, even though you're in the same dream as everybody else. And I thought, my God, that's profound. That's huge. You know, because there's no other way I could wrap my head around it when I would read that the ultimate reality was one without a second. I was like, well, Lord knows how you get there. I have no idea. But when I had that experience, I was like, oh, my God. I see the possibility of this. This really could be true. Right. Thanks, for me. And and. <laughs> And even now, it's, we cannot really tell whether it's a dream or not. There's no way we can deny it's not a dream, right? Even now. No, as a matter of fact, if you look at it quite closely, if you even through science looking at it, uh, <laughs> this material world is not going to betray its secrets to us. Every time we think we have found the smallest particle, they find more evidence that there's something still beyond that. You know, that's going to be the nature of it. That's why the rishis, the great rishis, stopped going outward in a scientific manner and uh, applied to the external world because they realized every time you find out something in the, in the material world, you've got five more questions born beyond it. There is, no, there is no resolving the material world because scientists, even at this point, can't say what matter is. There's not even a thing called matter. Everything seems to be just energy, that our bodies are even are made up of more space than substance. And uh, so, you know, even uh, I, I read a New York Times magazine, you know, I'm, I'm the perfect idiot for science. I know just enough to say the wrong thing and get myself in trouble. But I read this wonderful article about uh, quantum physics, and they were saying, according to quantum physics, the ultimate reality is a universe of black goo within which time runs forward and backward simultaneously and does not resolve into form until it is observed. And I read that and I was like, okay, no, is this science or did I just read the first page of a new Bible for a new religion or something? It's like, does, that does not sound like science to me. That sounds like religion to me. And uh, but that's the level they're working on these days. They're trying to they're trying to have to build they have to build these special apparatuses for testing ideas that are independent from thought, because just thinking about the experiment affects the experiment, you know, according to quantum physics. And so they're what they're having to do to study these notions and they're finding them to be true, which is even more shocking. You know, they're like, yeah, that's really the way it is. But as a layperson, you read that and you just go cross-eyed. You're like, well, I'll just believe in God. That's a lot easier. That's a lot more less complex, you know. <laughs> just, let's just give it a name and leave it. <laughs> yeah. But actually, um, uh, Swami, I mean, uh, it, uh, I think it was Mandukya Karika, one of them, where they say there's only two states of, of, uh, of, uh, of um, experiencing. One is dreaming and the other is deep sleep. So uh, I think it was Gaur uh, uh, Shankaracharya is Guru's guru who said that. And then uh, there's like 20 reasons, 20 answers as to how this, this life is a dream to, in answer to 
all our questions, oh, but, you know, this is longer or this is not the same as, as you know, whatever doubts that we have that this is not a dream. It actually has 20 different answers to say how it is a dream. So so it's it's like, you know, um, it's all been thought of before and and it's it's there. Like you said, the rishis had gone in and and experienced all this. Yes. Um, and even like that the universe happens when it is observed. I think it was one of the, one of, uh, again, one of the Vedantic things where it, the universe only appears when observed. I mean, that's, that's, that's one of their theories. Yeah. So, so, you, know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all there. It's just waiting to, 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 to be uh, um, realized in science, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is it yeah. Srishti, Drishti or Drishti? I, I always get mixed up. Uh, Drishti, Srishti. Right? As you see, it 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 becomes right. Am I right? Yeah. No, those, absolutely. Yeah. I I don't know the words for it. I I don't I don't. That doesn't help me much. So I don't think in those terms. Yeah, Drishti is, uh, is seeing. Srishti is the world. Yeah. So one is Srishti, Drishti that you are born into this world. I think I'm if I'm I may be mistaken. And the other one is that you no, know, you you create the world as 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 you are as you experience yeah. it. Yeah, no, there's no doubt. Uh, but but you know the Rishis found the truth because they stopped going outward and decided to turn around and put that focus inward because they were like, well, out there it keeps just branching off infinite infinitely but it all comes to a bottleneck here in the experiencer. So let's study the nature of the experiencer uh, and see what we can find. And that's where they came to realization. That's where they came to understanding. Mm -hmm. As long as science goes outward, there's not going to be a realization there. Mm -hmm. There's just going to be a continual travel into an infinite uh, unknown. You know, uh, It's not knowable in its, mm -hmm. in its final resolution. And so, but that's not to poo-poo it. It's it's important because it does. It, it is knowledge. It is a way of of observing God. And so, for those who who do go inward, uh, they see they see the same thing, and they understand the nature of the of, of well. Actually, we can't possibly understand, but at least we get ideas and moving in that direction anyway. The soul through which God sports is endowed with his special power, right? The landlord may reside in any part of his estate, but he is generally be, to be found in the particular drawing room. The devotee is God's drawing room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what a delightful thing. You are the meeting place of the divine. You are the drawing room, and that's where he can be found, hanging out in this world. But it's not outside. You know, outside temples are really an external manifestation of an internal reality. Our practice is just an external manifestation of an internal reality. Puja is just an external manifestation of an internal reality. You know? It's like it's 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 understanding. God is within all of this. All of this is within you. There is no external world in the final answer. But this is all within you, according to Vivekananda. And God is at the center of it. God, you, from your experience as an experiencer, you are the center. <laughs> you know, they say that's the difference between us and God is that we have one center with an infinite radius around us. God also has an infinite, an infinite radius, but God has infinite centers as well. And so, in a way, that's saying the same thing, that God has become each one of us and is sporting through the soul as each one of us. And so realization is coming to find that reality that you are a manifestation of the dreamer and everybody in the dream is going to come to that same understanding, that same realization. All right. Wow. It's already 8.06. So we'll stop there for the evening. 
that's unbelievable. 